to the way that he spotted this stuff so much before anybody else. Hi everyone, let's get started please. I'm Nikhil Kalyamper, I'm an assistant professor of international relations here at the LSE, where I research topics at the intersection of business government relations and economic statecraft. First off, I want to say welcome to this LSE public event to all of you and for weather in this horrible London weather day. Um, I am extremely excited about the event today and I first want to thank the LSE event staff and also our communications team at the IR department for all the work they've put in. I think most people in this room would agree that the benign vision of globalization is dying. Export controls, import restrictions, and targeted sanctions are fundamentally the tools of the game today. No scholars have done more to document what empirically and theoretically the rise of this new economic landscape as Henry Farrell and Abe Newman. Henry Farrell is the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Agora Institute Professor of International Affairs at Johns Hopkins SAIS. He works on a variety of topics, including democracy, the internet, and international political economy. He has published in the full swath of academic and policy outlets, including probably my favorite ever essay on the development of markets, an essay on the Silk Road illicit commercial empire almost 10 years ago for Eon. Abe Newman is professor of government at Georgetown University and at the School of Foreign Service. His research focuses on the ways in which economic interdependence and globalization have transformed international politics. Winner of the 2022-2023 Berlin Prize, he has published books on data privacy and international financial relations, while his popular pieces regularly appear in the New York Times and Foreign Affairs. We are here today to launch their new book, Underground Empire, which represents the culmination of more than a decade and a half of work together. We are here, uh, we are very, very fortunate to be joined by two brilliant discussants that I hope will both prod and provoke Abe and Henry's arguments today. The first is Les Leslie Vingemurray, who is a professor of international relations at SOAS, where she works on issues related to US foreign policy, international order, geopolitics, and human rights. She's currently leading research initiatives on reimagining multilateralism, the US, China, and the global recovery, and the global implications of threats to US democracy. She is also director of the U.S. Americas program at Chatham House, where she's the dean of the Queen Elizabeth II Academy. Next up, we will have Anne Pettifor, who is a political economist, whose latest book, the case, the case for the Green New Deal, is essential reading for anyone interested in sustainable futures. She is the director of policy research in macroeconomics, Prime, a network of economists that promote Keynes's monetary theory and policies, and that focus on the role of finance in the economy. She has a variety of different other posts, including council member of the Progressive Economy Forum and chair of the advisory board for Goldsmith College, Goldsmith College's Political Economy Research Center, to just name a couple. Our plan today is for Abe and Henry to get us kick-started with a roughly 15 to 20 minute overview of the book. We will then move into, um, on to Leslie's discussing the implications of the book for US foreign policy, and we'll then, uh, then Anne will take the floor to discuss some broader implications for political and economic development based on their arguments. And we'll then open up the, the space to audience discussion. And I hope all of you will participate. The first thing to note is that we will be, uh, we will be recording this, and so that your questions will go into a podcast form later. Uh, I will be moderating the, uh, the Q&A part. And so if I ask you to speak, please wait till the mic shows up that, that are roving around by our event staff. And when you do speak, please give us your name and affiliation. For those of you still tweeting, or Xing, for that matter. Um, the hashtag for today's event is LSEIR. And if you haven't got a chance to pick up Underground Empire yet, there will be books available for purchase after the event. But without further ado, Abe and Henry, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for uh, organizing this. Uh, thank you uh, to Kate, who I hope is somewhere in the audience, for putting the difficult details together. And thank you to Leslie and Anne. I'm looking forward so much to the conversation. And also thank you to all of you uh, for having traipsed through this truly miserable weather. Uh, I left Ireland in the early 1990s. I left it for a reason, and uh, we see the reason right <laughs> around us today. So, but we're going to be talking about uh, The Underground Empire, which is this book that Abe and I have written, uh, which, is, uh, which has been a departure for us. It is a book that is intended for a broader audience. It is not a traditional academic book. Uh, one of the things that we'd be most gratified by is various people telling us that it reads like a thriller. That is exactly what we wanted it to read uh, like. But at the same time, we also wanted to tell a deeper story about the way in which the world has been transformed. 
And here, our argument is very, very different from the standard arguments about globalization, which all of you are uh, familiar with, and which Nick briefly referred to at the beginning, where, where the argument that we make is that we agree with people who suggest that globalization is all about international networks. So we think that if you want to understand how global markets work today, you need to pay attention to the deep financial networks, the information networks, the supply chains, the manufacturing networks, which weave the world economy together. But we have a different story about the consequences of those networks than the standard story that really used to prevail up until a few years ago. And the standard version of the story was, of course, given by Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist and best-selling author of The World is Flat, who suggested that this world of networks was going to be fundamentally a place that brought us together, that the global economy was going to be, in his word, words, it was going to be like a web. It was going to be the World Wide Web. It was going to be a, a, uh, a set of networks which would allow everybody to compete together on an equal footing. So that uh, this was, in his view, this was a replacement for, for the old world of the Cold War. So he suggested that we were moving from the world uh, which had been divided by a Berlin, the Berlin Wall, we were moving from that to a world which was going to be brought together by a web, by this humming, harmonious uh, marketplace in which all of us would be able to compete fairly and in which traditional forms of geopolitics, traditional forms of uh, global coercion would simply have no role to play they would be ruled out almost by definition. Of course, this is not the world that we saw. Uh, we've seen over the last few years, it has become increasingly obvious that globalization simply does not have that kind of politics. This is not just due to the uh, gentleman who is uh, in the uh, top corner here. It is also something that we have seen much more generally across uh, different countries, Japan, South Korea, the uh, economic aspects of the sanctions against Russia, the ways in which the United States is using uh, semiconductors to try to uh, strangle uh, China's ability to engage in certain kinds of military AI, all of these uh, represent ways in which these global networks that were supposed to hold the world together, were supposed to make it harmonious, have become instead the vectors of power and the uh, vectors of coercion. They have spread coercion and they have been means which have been used by powerful governments in order to achieve uh, by different uh, means, the, uh, the, the, in order to achieve their strategic objectives and in order very often to weaken their enemies. So this is a different world than the world that we expected that we were in. Abe and I started to get interested in this in 2018, 2019, when we began to think about the SWIFT network, which is one of the big networks that holds the world together. It is a crucial part of the global financial system. And we began to observe how it is that networks like this, they tend not to be these equalizing forces that people like Thomas Friedman thought that they were, because they tend to get centralized. They get centralized for a variety of reasons. Uh, businesses want to achieve monopoly. Very often the best way to achieve monopoly is to become a central actor in a network. Sometimes it turns out that, uh, that, that networks which are centralized turn out to be more efficient. There are a variety of different ways in which these global networks became centralized, but centralized they did become. And our argument is that this is really what made the world into the wor world that it is today. Because once you have a centralized web, well, we know what lurks at the heart of centralized webs, and it's usually not something that has any particular des desire to be friendly or to be nice to the webs, that, uh, to the spiders that get, or sorry, to the flies rather, excuse my uh, mixed metaphor, to the flies that get entangled in the web at the, at the outskirts. So we are in a world where we have these uh, powerful governments Governments, and especially the United States, but also increasingly China and the European Union is considering it as well, trying to use these central parts of the network in order to coerce, in order to uh, effectively exercise power through these uh, systems, through these global financial networks that were never supposed to have power at their heart. So how did this happen? This is a story that we really tell in the book. We tell the stories of the origins of the system. And as Abe likes to put it, Abe is a fan of superheroes, uh, superhero comics. And he thinks about this as being a little bit like uh, the origin story of Spider-Man or a similar type of uh, superhero, that we have effectively this, uh, this sudden moment 
where the uh, superhero realizes that they have powers and then they, uh, the, then they begin to exercise those powers. And for our story, the key moment is September 11th, 2001. The moment when the uh, Twin Towers um, sort of uh, uh, get hit is a moment when uh, the United States begins to consider all of the different things uh, that it can do in order to try and fight back against terrorism. It begins to look at this global network that it has allowed to come into being, this financial network, this information network, and it begins to investigate ways in which it can use these networks in order to push back against terrorism. And so this involves, for example, some very, very extensive understanding of the internet and some very extensive ability to use the internet, in effect, as a tool of networked surveillance. And this is a map from the uh, Snowden revelations, the S Snowden leaks, which shows uh, the NSA and how it is that the NSA figured out that there are international choke points in uh, uh, global telecommunications and in, in, in the internet, and it uses these choke points in order to get access to vast amounts of communications which are going uh, from different parts of the world uh, because all of these have to cross through uh, US territory, and the US exerts what it calls transit authority, a form of legal authority in order to grab access to everybody's communications. This uh, then uh, becomes the basis for a system in which the United States isn't just going after terrorists anymore. It begins increasingly to view this as an opportunity to go after a variety of other adversaries, uh, including uh, uh, initially Iran through the uh, SWIFT network. Then it begins to uh, look at uh, China through uh, Huawei, uh, the uh, ambitions that the Chinese com company of telecommunications giant Huawei has to build 5G networks. The United States sees as being a direct threat to its authority, so it starts to push back against this. It uh, most recently uh, has engaged, of course, in extensive sanctions and uh, controls on exports of semiconductors and things uh, of that nature to Russia. And finally, it has uh, banned the export of certain crucial uh, semiconductors which are needed for AI. It has banned the export of these to China and also has sought to ensure that China cannot get the necessary machinery that it would need to build similar semiconductors itself. So. <laughs> uh, so I think Henry's so tall. I can't even see you over there. Let's see if I can. Oh, there we go. Um, so, you know, in the first two parts of the book, which Henry really talked about, first is just this other version of globalization, one that's centralized, not decentralized. In the second part of the book, we talk about this origin of how you get a super power with superpowers. And in the third part of the book, it's how that unfolds when it starts to use those in this very kind of incremental, accidental way where it's, it's facing wicked problems, whether it's terrorism, non-proliferation, concerns about China. It starts to use these tools one after the next and builds in often unanticipated ways. And so I'm just gonna briefly show you kind of the three main kind of relationships as the new superpower is used, how it both sometimes succeeds and sometimes releases really unexpected and potentially quite devastating consequences. Um, so the first, uh, as the first slide just demonstrated, was about China. And here, what the United States is worried about is that China might be able to do to the United States what the United States had been doing to the world in the Snowden revelations. And that's really in this company, Huawei. Com uh, Huawei was developing the next generation of the internet at the, po at the time, it was called 5G. Now we're probably already on to 6G. But the worry was is that if this Chinese company has, let's say, access to these data flows, then it could be uh, a, a national security threat. And the US doesn't have a competitor because of the very market reasons we told at the beginning. It believed in open markets, and those open markets then sold the US company that played in this space to a European company, which then sold it to another European company. And ultimately, the United States has to look to other networks, other ways to confront this challenge. And so here, I'm just giving you the two that we talk about in the book, which is first, the financial networks. Uh, you know, this is a, um, uh, Meng was the COO of Huawei. She's the daughter of the founder of the company. And she takes a flight uh, from China to Vancouver to a business event in Mexico. 
and she never gets any further than Vancouver. Uh, it's a fun, I, well, I don't know if it's a funny story, but she's arrested by the Canadian Mounties. And I just imagine them with their funny hats and you know, like horses coming in to get, but what happens is, is she's arrested there on fin concerns about financial crime. And how is that even possible? It's because the United States has information about Huawei's financial claims that they are gonna use to get her uh, arrested in Canada and then hopefully extradited to the United States. At the same time, the United States is using a whole set of innovations in export controls in order to degrade Huawei's ability to make these next generation technologies. And these export controls don't just look at banning access to the US market, but look at ways that US intellectual property is strung through the products of com companies all across the globe. And so ultimately, a company like TSMC, which is Taiwanese, faces these restrictions because US intellectual property is part of their systems. Now, of course, it seemed for a time that these things might work, that they might deter uh, the Chinese capability in this, uh, in this space. But just uh, a few weeks ago, the US uh, Secretary of Commerce, she travels to China on a diplomatic mission. It's really a calming down mission. And she, at, I think it's no coincidence that when she lands, a, a new Huawei phone is released. One that is, at least uh, from reports, circumvents uh, these export controls. Now, it's still unclear how they created this technology, whether it was that they got around them or the, the export controls themselves were written in a way that allowed this to happen. But either way, it shows how this, once the underground empire is revealed, that it can uh, set off a set of unanticipated consequences that uh, perhaps the superpower had not intended. Um, the other thing that, I, that we talk about in the book are the ways in which states, once they're the target of these new powers, they don't just give up, but they think about ways to evade or to get around these types of controls. And here I just put up the India-Russia uh, oil exchange, clearly, these sanctions against Russia have increased the costs for uh, Russia to export its uh, oil in the world, it, but it's still selling them. Now it's sitting on a lot of rupees, the question is what will it do with them, but either way, they're not just sitting on the oil at home. The second set of stories are the relationship between the United States and Europe. And here I put up a quote from the uh, commissioner at the time, the vice president of the European Commission, where she says, we've awakened into the era of weaponized interdependence. And that was uh, the article that Henry mentioned that we wrote uh, uh, in 2019. And really, a set of crises, the COVID crisis, uh, the Russia war, tensions with China, have all made the vision of Europe, one which was for a long time based on openness, you know, the four freedoms of the treaties. It was an idea that peace and prosperity would go through trade, has really been radically challenged in this wake-up call. And that has led a, a huge transformation in Europe. Um, just earlier this spring, the European Union released uh, its first ever se economic security agenda, which in many ways is a response to the things that the United States did under the Trump administration. It's a way to kind of think about a path forward that would secure Europe's autonomy. But at the same time, Europe has been revealed through the Russia war as so reliant on these economic powers of the United States as it tries to conduct its foreign policy. Uh, so the question I think for Europe and for uh, Britain today is how much can they rely on this power? What is the thing that would keep it in check? How much of the Biden administration's guarantees can be counted on as uh, a future election uh, stands in the near future? The last kind of relationship that's unwound in the book is that between the actors that are creating the networks, the very market players, what do they do as they become really the foot soldiers in this new battlefield? Um, and here we tell a number of stories. We start with LinkedIn, uh, a LinkedIn post that TSMC uh, had right after uh, the China tech um, controls are put into place. And it read, seeking uh, an expert of, with geoeconomic um, expertise. And it's one of those things where it's like, how can you be TSMC and not have geoeconomic expertise? But for many companies, this was just not in their uh, focus. They had bought into the freedom version of globalization and as a result, 
uh, we're not prepared for this world. And TSMC really tries to stay neutral in this battlefield, to say they're not going to pick sides. Uh, then we tell the story of Microsoft, which is a company that at the beginning does the same thing. They even uh, promote this idea of a digital Geneva Convention, where you know companies would be uh, kept neutral in these new battles between states. Uh, but what happens, we tell the story of the Ukraine war, where they actually uh, pick sides. There's a remarkable, uh, uh, um, it's a corporate event, where Brad Smith, uh, the head of Microsoft, to, gives this speech where he says, we, you know, we were part of the front line of the response uh, to the Russian invasion, and we lifted uh, the Ukrainian government into the cloud. And what I think, I don't know if people have read Stormship Troopers, uh, the, it's a kind of a, a futuristic uh, world where corporations uh, become part of the war state. But he starts to talk about how we are going to save the, emperor, the enterprise and the citizen uh, from this war. And what becomes clear is it becomes a marketing or it's a test case of the capabilities that Microsoft has where they can be part uh, of an effort that saves a government facing imminent demise. But the risks for companies, I think, are not just about what they do uh, in public, but also what then people find out about. And that's clearly happened in the Starlink case, where in the first wave of news around Starlink, the satellite system that's run by Elon Musk, um, it was a part of the effort by Ukraine to defend itself. And it was really heralded as a remarkable uh, instance where a company could provide capabilities that a government itself didn't have. It was then released in Musk's uh, um, autobiography, or not uh, biography, that um, he, was, uh, he denied uh, the use of Starlink in, in an attack that Ukraine was trying to carry out against uh, the Soviet fleet. And basically, the Ukrainian drones uh, just turned off in the middle of that attack. And that's, a, and I think, the blowback then to Starlink has been quite clear that people are saying, well, how could we rely on a critical infrastructure run by somebody who, at least um, in the news, is reported uh, to be uh, a fan of ketamine? A fan of ketamine. Okay. So. The problem here is that all of these relationships that we've documented, the, the China relationship, the Europe relationship with business, is that you can quickly enter a tit-for-tat world that uh, falls into uh, rapid escalation and the demise of globalization, which has brought us so much wealth. I mean, all of the things that we enjoy, our day-to-day -day life is dependent on these global markets. And so what happens if they start to tear apart? And this is a great book that we would recommend, Nick Mulder, where he really talks historically about if you just use these economic weapons, they're a different type of economic weapon than we described, but it's a similar, uh, a similar dynamic, then you can quickly go down to a world where economic war becomes even kinetic war. And so in the last part of the book, uh, which I'll turn to now, we try to give a, you know, a hopeful ending, because I'm an optimist. You know, I want to give you a story of how, what can we do? We need to act if we're going to save all of the benefits that globalization has produced. And so the first is simply, we just don't understand these battlefields. These markets that have been wielded by states against each other are extremely complex. And many companies themselves don't understand their supply chains, the third or fourth tier in them. And so you know, we're basically calling for a Manhattan-like project to study and understand them so we don't get the unanticipated consequences, which we talk about in the book. I was speaking with a former govern government official yesterday where he said, in the area of export controls, the US government has not one official who is looking at the long-term consequences of using these tools. Well, for me, that's just, it's just unbelievable that we could be in a place where we're using tools without thinking through the second or third order consequences. At the second time, we have to build institutions that would allow us to use these tools in a responsible way. And here, it's where the United States can learn from its allies. Um, I, you don't really need to read this, uh, the, the, what's up, the words, but these are just examples of what's happening in Japan. Japan was hit by Chinese coercion very early, and they have an institutional response. They have a cabinet official that's responsible for economic coercion, and they've created a legal structure so they can fund and prevent and protect uh, their societies. Uh, Henry and I then, we have a recent piece in Foreign Affairs where we talk about how we need to come up with a set 
of basically guardrails to protect ourselves from these new weapons. You know, when the Cold War started, when nuclear weapons uh, were uh, first on the scene, they did not come with a rule book. People did not know what was going to happen, and the scholars at the time were quite concerned that you could radically quickly have unanticipated consequences or miscalculation. And so they came up with ideas like mutually assured destruction, uh, those ideas that protect us today with these new weapons, or those weapons. So in just a, like that uh, time, we're calling for, you know, we need the same kind of effort to think through how do we prevent um, the unanticipated use or the uh, ratcheting up of these tools. The final point is just these, a lot of the ways the underground empire has been used are about sticks. They're about telling people if you don't do stuff that we want, we'll hit you. And you have to embed that with a set of carrots. You have to give people inducements to come on board with your strategy. You know, I always think if you're going, if you want, if the United States and the NATO partners want to limit Huawei's penetration of the 5G system, then it's important to, you know, subsidize the purchase of Nokia and Ericsson products. You can't just tell people don't do something and then not give them an alternative. And so in all of these domains, whether it's uh, technology or climate or corruption, you can't just tell people not to do things, but you have to then give them a set of uh, economic incentives to do something else. So just to conclude, you know, we want to give you a different picture, not the picture that we've been sold for so many years, that globalization is simply, uh, you know, all benefit with no risk. That these economic networks that have been constructed have centralized economic exchange. They create vulnerabilities. We all know that from COVID, you know, the toilet paper crisis. But it's not just random problems like the toilet paper crisis. It's that governments strategically use that structure to inflict damages on their adversaries. And unfortunately, this has happened very much in a piecemeal way where states have slowly built up these efforts, particularly the United States, without thinking through what is the strategy? What is the architecture? How we keep people safe while we use these tools? And unfortunately, if we don't come up with that language pretty quickly, the, the very thing that has brought so much wealth and prosperity to the world, globalization, could be at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Ibn Henry. Leslie, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> great. It's it's really quite an honor to be on a panel with the two of you. I can I I haven't known you as long, Henry Abe. I consider you a friend, but I still consider the two of you rock stars and gods in the field of international political economy. So it really is tremendous to be here with you. I would encourage you. In addition, I actually have, we both have our hard copies because we're students of the book, aren't we, right now? Um, but I, I encourage you to read the book because it's, it's a compelling read as well as a, a very fluent read. It's really um, gripping and it's very, very interesting. Um, for those of you who are also students, whether you're um, young or old, of globalization and international political economy, I would say read all of their work because it really is a body of work that has come to influence um, all of our discussions of global political economy. And for a while, I didn't know who both of you were. And, I, and all my friends from the US and beyond who were talking about political economy kept talking about weaponization. And, then, and it was a term that was divorced from you because you had so much influence with the first article. I got. But it took me a while to work out who were the people behind, behind this extremely influential body of work. So um, I do encourage you to take a really serious look at it. I also wanted to say um, I'm an alumni of the LSE. I finished my master's degree in 1992. And one of the greatest thinkers um, of political economy in the world um, was a professor here. She held the Montague Burton chair from 1978 to 88. I did just have to check the years because <laughs> mm -hmm. her influence is enduring. She's no longer with us. Um, but Susan Strange, and I think it's particularly um, apt that you invited, or whoever invited you to speak here uh, did so, because Susan Strange wrote many books. She started her career at The Economist. She then went on to be a professor. She was the first woman to be the president of the International Studies Association. And one of her books, uh, States and Markets, which was published in 1988, for me and for so many of us who were students not long after it was published, 
had a profound influence because she said, you know, you're, you're all out there talking about GDP and what percentage of the global economy America has, what its military and economic capabilities are, and then, you know, maybe how America gets somebody else to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do, you know, classic definitions of power. And she said, no, it's about structural power. And it's not that those other things aren't important, but you need to understand what are the basic structures uh, globally and who has control of them. And to me, your book and your broader body of work sits very squarely in this space, um, but takes it to, to a whole new dimension. But it really is, and maybe I'm misreading, but I see it very much in that tradition. So given that we're at the London School of Economics and that she, is, she was a truly extraordinary scholar and woman, um, I think really important to, to just mention her work. I love the part of the book that talks about, you know, the the sort of, I always, what is the accidental tourist? Is that a book or is that a story? <laughs> whatever it was, but it's like, this is the accidental, um, you know, superpower hegemon, whatever, that suddenly doesn't realize it's creating the United States, creating all these new ways of controlling um, new structures in the economy, but then suddenly realizes it does, and it's like, whoa, look at what we have here, and now let's use it. Um, so it is a, you know, there's so many parts of the story as well as the, the theoretically very rigorous body of academic work that, under, that underpins and, and is, uh, that is in this book that, that is just really, truly extraordinary. I just want to say a couple of things, and I'm sure we'll come back to all sorts of things um, in the discussion. One is, um, you know, for, for so long and, and still we're all talking about the, the rules-based order is what they say in Europe and America. They talk about the liberal international order, the LIO. Um, and, um, and we talk about these different phases of, you know, globalization um, uh, in which there was, you know, America was this wonderful power that helped other countries around the world um, benefit from its markets, that it responded to the Kindleberger thesis and it sort of kept everything op open and allowed, and I know that there's a lot, there's another side of the story, so don't worry. <laughs> I teach it so as I know. <laughs> um, but, but that was kind of the, the, the way that America was captured. Um, and then we talk about globalization and really um, Henry and Abe, professors Farrell and Newman have taken us into this next phase, which is it's, it's no longer embedded liberalism where you look out for people beyond your borders and inside your country. It's no longer kind of neoliberalism where everybody's just getting rich and not paying much attention. Now it's sort of there are these structures and America controls them and watch out. And I know there's a lot more to it, but that's <laughs> kind of how it reads. And so my question is, you know, as you've said in your presentations and in your work, is like what does it mean for the rules-based order, because the rules-based order at some level is very much based um, on some sense of predictability, stability, trust, and um, confidence in the United States of America. And as we all know, that you know, trust, and we, we've seen this in various uh, public opinion polling, you know, it ebbs and flows, anti-Americanism ebbs and flows, but we know that there's a whole lot less of it than there used to be and so when you read this and you read the stories and you think about the extraordinary power that America now has to cut people off, cut states off, whether it's through whatever mechanism, um, it, it raises, you know, once again, this problem of what does this mean for the rules-based order um, at a time when it's already been deeply problematic. And what is you know, the values proposition that the United States offers if it, if it can't necessarily or won't necessarily offer that predictability and that stability and a promise that it won't use these, um, these abilities or capabilities against you. And I guess that leads to my second point, which is the, you know, the friends and allies versus adversaries question. And um, you know, in your work, which spans the book and just just an extraordinary amount of research and publication and, and talking and thinking. I'm curious if you could, you know, when we when we come to the discussion, say more about the the friends versus the adversaries part of this. Because as you know, and as we all know, Europe feels very much like, is it still a friend of America? <laughs> it feels that it's on the receiving end um, increasingly of the hard edge of America's 
uh, weaponization, and I'm using the term generically, not technically. You have very specific uh, explanations and, 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 um, uh, of, of the instrument. But there is a general feeling uh, in, the part, in the part of Europe that it doesn't know when it's going to be on the wrong end of these instruments. And so I'm curious, in your view, how great that risk is and whether you see thinking within the U.S. government a apart from you know the things that you that you point out in your foreign affairs article, right? There's a EU US Trade and Technology Council, with the, which I think this country is not part of. Is that right? It sometimes gets to sit in <laughs> if it's lucky. Um, so sorry, UK. Um, but there is a concern. We, we know during the Huawei case that um, you know the UK wanted initially to balance its position on 5G, to let it into certain parts of the network and not other parts. And it goes to your point about if you're going to, cut pe if you're going to tell people not to use Huawei, give them an alternative. And the UK was trying to make, take a measured position. And ultimately, it, it, it couldn't sustain that because of the UK's sanctions, as I understand it. I'm sure you can say more about that. Um, today, and it maybe falls outside of your framework, but today we heard about the sanctions that the US is leveraging against uh, companies and individuals in a variety of different countries, one of which is Turkey, a complicated country, but it is a NATO ally of the United States. Um, again, just a whole series of questions, I think, in Europe and beyond about when you start talking about weaponization in general and some of these more specific tools, are they going to be reliably in or re reliably out? And then I guess my, my third point is, does it matter for the US? And, and I know that I used to sit around so many really tremendous conversation tables when I was teaching at Georgetown. And it was not long after the US invasion of Iraq. And um, one of the questions that kept getting raised is, okay, we know people are very skeptical about this. We know there's a backlash. We know that Europeans have been protesting. Um, we know that we're losing some people, but so what? Does it really matter? And it wasn't that these individuals felt this way, but they were asking the what's at stake. So what? America can do these things. America's so powerful. Even if people don't necessarily follow, even if it doesn't always go well, what's the real cost? And so I, I guess my question for you, and you, you've already talked about it, you've certainly talked about it in the book, but could you say even more about what you think the real cost is to the United States? And how do you even begin to measure it? Is it you know, just something that you should look at case by case? Or is there a longer term cost? Or is there really no cost at all? Because we all know that the balance of, econ I mean, I'm not an economist, but I listen to them. I try to understand. And the balance opinion seems to be that there is no alternative to the dollar. There is no real balance. You know, there's no real alternative at scale to SWIFT. There's, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, so does it matter? Can America just throw its power around, use these capabilities when it wishes, and at the end of the day, um, you know, if you're a friend, you're sometimes not a friend. If you aren't, you know, you're really in trouble. Um, what is the real cost? And maybe you could say even more about that. And then final question to you. It's what everybody in the room wants to know uh, in the UK and Europe. Um, how much of this, how, many, how much of the structural power in the, the two areas that you talk about in the book in particular, but in general, the weaponization argument, do you anticipate that it is highly subject to political change at the very top? It's the Trump question, and even if it's not Trump, it's the sort of radical republicanism question where friends really aren't friends, um, where that's how friends feel. Um, how much worse could it get? Or do you think that this at some level is so, to use you know, some of what you said, so technical and so therefore technocratic um, that at the end of the day, uh, there's a level of protection that just comes from the fact that this is very difficult for most people to understand how and when you would leverage the tool. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Leslie. Um, Abe and Henry will have a chance to respond in a bit, but before that, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like you to know that I haven't been paid to, <laughs> to tell you that. Please rate and yeah. review this on Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, this panel is made up of academics. And so they haven't yet conveyed, even the authors, uh, the thrilling and gripping nature of this book. Terrifying as well, actually. But it's a fantastic read. And so I do really strongly recommend you read it, even though I have my own reservations about its thesis. And when I was read, working on preparing for today, I just happened on this story in the, on Twitter, actually, uh, 
China's space station, in 2011, the US Congress passed the Wolf Amendment, which forbade NASA uh, from cooperating with China. Today, US Chief of Space Operations has said that the pace with which China has been able to put these capabilities into play and the scale at which they are putting these capabilities is the most alarming thing. So, you know, the, the point this book is making is that by virtue of uh, excluding China and not cooperating with China, it, it the United States has in fact empowered China. Um, so, you know, there, this book is a fantastic read, and it's f fantastic read for people like me who think of the global system in economic terms. And I have to say that, you know, I, I was a bit frustrated because the impression was given that Wall Street, yeah, Wall Street does govern the world, in my view, but actually Will, Wall Street was enabled by policies that were very deliberately enacted by the United States political system. These didn't happen because Walter Riston, the, 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 the governor of, uh, the CEO of Citibank, who is mentioned a lot in the first chapter, uh, was clever and powerful and understood technology and, and improved communications and so on. It happened because Nixon and other American presidents had actually created a framework, a global framework, which would enable bankers like the chief executive of Citibank to operate in the way they did. It would enable Wall Street to become as powerful as it did. This was deliberate, it was not accidental. And I, I you know, that frustrates me because I think in those terms uh, of the framework. And I'm also struck, if I may say so, by the conclusion of this book, which is in the conclusion that Abe has just given us now, which is that what can we do to fix this thing? And I have to say that I think it's past fixing. We're in a situation where the South, the global South, has decided that it has to detach itself from the systems that the United States have created. It has to detach itself from the dollar. And there's a lot of floundering about, and you're quite right to say, Leslie, that the dollar is very powerful still, and there is no substitute for it. But they're working on it in the way that they're working on their space station. But the key point I want to make is that they have given up on the idea of a, an international, a global system uh, in which everyone will prosper. They understand, and you know, I feel very conscious of this because as a result of the war in Ukraine, I could see the consolidation of the global south against the west. And what was most striking for me was South Africa, which is the country of my birth. The South Africans were very clear that they were going to align themselves on the, the, the part of the world that supported Russia. They were a bit ambiguous about their support of Russia, but they shifted their allegiance away from the West towards China and Russia. And I found that incredibly disturbing. And it's a consequence of this system of globalization, which um, has led to those divisions. And I'm not sure that the United States can repair that now. And I think the, the struggle in the Middle East at the moment, again, is evidence of how the West, this is fracturing. The West is being detached from large numbers of countries, Turkey, uh, you know, Iran, of course, and Russia, but also China and lots of countries in Africa. The majority of the United Nations that voted on, uh, the, that on, voted on the Palestinian issue. So this is very disturbing because while these countries want the detachment, they haven't yet got an alternative to the dollar or a system. They're going to have to do that. So I'm, I'm less optimistic than Abe and, and Henry are about the fact that this can be fixed. It reminds me very much of what happened in the 1930s, and this is where Karl Polanyi was so incisive and had the insights. I have to say I'm so glad to hear Susan Strange mentioned because she too understood this. But Karl Polanyi argued that you know, this incredible system of, of markets, which is complex, and, 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 and in the 1930s it was equally complex, not as sophisticated as it is today, but it was complex. Suddenly a dislocation happens, and the whole thing screws up, and then there's chaos, and, and inevitably leads to catastrophic failure, and that's what happened in the 1930s. And Polanyi argued that if we did that, 
if we restored something like the gold standard, uh, we would then be recreating a system which collapsed in the way it did in the 1930s. And that lesson has been ignored. So I'm not as, as, as optimistic as these two, but I, um, I do think that people like me, economists who think about the system in an international sense, in a, a theoretical sense, don't understand enough about the technology and the way in which the systems of communication and banking systems have interlinked and have worked. There's some fascinating chapters here on what happened around the internet and on a place called Ashburn, which you'll never have heard of, but <laughs> after this you, you're going to know it as well as you know Silicon Valley. Anyway, I'll stop there, but it's a must read. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Leslie. Abe and Henry, do you want a few minutes to respond? Um, sure. I, I want to first just thank Leslie and Anne. I, I also, I was just sitting here and I, this, like, for an author to see somebody do this to their book <laughs> yeah. is, like, so heartwarming because a lot of times you, you write something and it goes into, like, a, a dusty library and you're like, I don't know, did anybody look at that? But anyway, so I think we're just very honored uh, for these very thoughtful comments and this very deep uh, exploration of, of our, our work. I think we could spend so many hours with um, these <laughs> points that were raised. So I will just touch on a few and then Henry can touch on a few. Um, I, I think w just on the last point, which is I think the, our takeaway is that you cannot put the genie back in the bottle, that these things have been released. Uh, but I think Henry and I are both optimistic by nature and so it's to say, how do we contain the fallout of these things? Uh, I think if you, if you saw the movie Oppenheimer, you could quickly go into that things will spiral out of control. But somehow it was contained uh, in a way that the, 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 the fear and the danger did not spill over into the entire collapse of this uh, planet. And so I, what we're trying to say is, you know, if we can acknowledge that things have changed and instead of just kind of fumbling through, that we can keep the bad part uh, in a box and then allow the other stuff to, to, to continue as, as well as possible. Um, I think I, I want to take this point about, um, you know, what are the consequences of using these tools? Uh, because I think it comes in the fracturing of the global south and the, the allies, and these are a bunch of different um, points that kind of go to look together. And I think a lot of times the focus is on will the networks be replaced? Will the dollar be replaced? And, and here, I think Henry and I are, are I, it's almost a red herring. It's like the, that isn't the primary focus. It's these other political consequences that are happening that we really need to be worried about. And so I put up the, the rupee uh, Russia trade. It, it's just an example of what that's never going to replace the dollar as the global uh, currency, reserve currency, but it creates dark spaces in the international system where other non-dollar based activity is happening that can, where illicit uh, transactions can occur. And it also is exactly what Anne was talking about, is that it creates these resentments uh, in other countries where then when you need them to cooperate, you know, they're not there to be your partner. Mm -hmm. And one of, I think, the biggest lessons was like how little we focused on the consequences of 9-11 and that it really did transform people's trust in other societies where you get people saying things like, well, aren't, isn't Chinese spying just like American spying? And there, I just have to say, no, it is not. There, there's a very different character. But if we act in these ways that do not provide trust, it's not going to replace the dollar because the dollar provides a lot of collective goods, but it has a lot of other consequences. And I think the real uh, fear is that it could then also lead to these tit-for-tat interactions with China, where things escalate in a way uh, that other bad stuff, not, it's not even about the, the dollar is just a small player, and that's really where you get the 1930s um, scenario where things become kinetic, where people start to say, well, if we can't uh, be free and produce our own technologies and goods, then we have to, uh, to, to, to lash out. Um, the final point I just want to touch on is the, uh, the Trump question, because I think it's um, in everybody's mind. Uh, and I think w uh, Henry and I, we had a piece in the New York Times a few weeks ago where we basically, you know, it's not just about Trump. 
These, Biden has used many of these tools. The difference is, is that Biden has attempted to wrap them in transparency. All the things about the liberal order, you know, is to say you should be, you, sh you should know how to expect when we will use them, what the limits of the use will be, uh, how we will do it with allies, not against allies. And in many ways, I think our partners have viewed these in a very positive light. Uh, the problem is, is that just like the international order, there's no real enforcement. You know, the, the international order, the WTO or the UN, it's just about, it's just about a set of agreements that people, it, there's not really anything that can happen if you break them, and that's what we learned in the Iraq war. And so how do you create a language, norms, expectations that we should do things like consult allies before we use these tools? And that's where I think there needs to be a much bigger conversation amongst international lawyers, for example, to say, what, are the, what, what is the international law of economic coercion? And that's something we don't, we don't have yet. OK, like Abe said, as Abe said, there is just much, much more here than uh, I could possibly. <laughs> so I'm going to try and weave it together. And first of all, just to acknowledge Susan Strange. I, 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 and we, we don't mention her in the book. We do mention in the article, uh, sort of which the book uh, came from, we, affect, uh, we, we identify ourselves explicitly as being in that tradition. Because she was really writing at a time when international relations was, uh, it saw itself as being a fight between realists on the one hand and liberals on the other. And, uh, and, and so she had an understanding of power which was fundamentally different from the realist understanding of power, and which also showed uh, how a lot of what the liberals were arguing, it wasn't that it was exactly wrong, but it was very often beside the point. It missed the deeper structures that, uh, and really, I'm sort of, you know, so we, you know, as, as you said, we are emphatically in the uh, Susan Strange uh, tradition, and uh, we are both, sort of, I think, sort of quite gratified to be <laughs> identified as part of that tradition because it's an extraordinarily powerful intellectual tradition, and uh, I would love to see it. I would love to see it really revived and brought to the center because Strange was treated as if she was kind of this, um, you know, she couldn't be ignored completely, uh, but she was not treated as one of the central people in the debates. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of gender politics playing into that as well. Uh, and. Uh, we live in Susan Strange's world, uh, I think, and in a world where the politics she described have become absolutely central. Mm -hmm. So this is a much, much more complex world. And this gets to your question. Another part of the question about the uh, Trump thing is, is this just going to be too complicated for the Trump people to understand? On the one hand, one of the weird things we discovered I'm sort of while write this book is how often things that seem obvious in retrospect were not obvious to policymakers as of when they were putting things together. We have one terrifying anecdote in our book where we uh, discover that our ideas uh, possibly helped to uh, pull the Trump administration's attention to some things that it might not otherwise have uh, observed. Uh, but also, uh, we talked to John Bolton at one stage, where he says, you know, more or less, well, there are these um, sort of export control rules called the entity list. He hadn't heard of them before they came up, and he was delighted to find out about them. So people, you know, so, so there is a lot more ignorance of possibilities, even among relatively sophisticated policymakers than you might imagine. Uh, what seems from the outside side like this vast, monolithic, terrifyingly powerful structure is in fact being run by uh, 30 or 40 overworked, stressed, harassed people uh, trying to deal with emergency after emergency and never having nearly as much information or as much time to consider information as they want, so things get overlooked. Equally, I think that the Trump II administration, if it happens, is going to be vastly more sophisticated than Trump I. If you look, for example, at the Heritage Foundation, it is really uh, trying to vet a uh, sort of vet a observe a, a new and much more sophisticated group of people to follow through the Trump agenda and to make sure that various people who in the original Trump one administration uh, slow walked stuff or didn't talk about stuff that uh, might be uh, sort of uh, useful that the, that this <coughs> does not happen again and that Trump is allowed to reach its full potential. Now, obviously, this will not work 100%. Equally, obviously, I think that uh, the uh, allies have. <laughs> 
no idea what is in store for them if Trump manages to get back in again. I think that this is going to be a, a very, very, very difficult time, and it's going to be a particularly difficult time for Europe. I think that is going to be extremely worrying. Uh, Anne's criticisms are very well taken. Uh, we have, you know, when we write a book, when you write a book that's a couple of hundred pages, you know that you are going to, you know, your ideal is that you're going to set up good arguments where people are going to push back well against you. you know, so if you think you're coming down from the uh, mountaintop with the uh, tablets that have the truth inscribed <laughs> upon them, you have uh, vast pretensions that are going to be uh, very, very quickly revealed to be what they are. And what, but you do try to, and Abe and I did try to anticipate some of what seemed to us to be the obvious things that we didn't deal with in the book and that we ought to have said more about. And one of the things we say in the uh, concluding part where we have the acknowledgments that nobody reads except for the people who hope or believe that they ought to be in the acknowledgments, uh, <laughs> we have a little bit at the end of that where we say we recognize that this is a book which is written from the perspective of the empire builders. It's about the empire builders, it's about uh, the great powers, it's about the United States, it's about China, and it's about Europe. And we say there is another book which, is, uh, which needs to be written, which is really written about uh, what is happening from the bottom up, what is happening with all of the other people who are trying to adjust to and to deal with this power dynamics. And here I think Anne is absolutely right. And I think that uh, this has been proved to be more important even even than we realized it was going to be. Over the last year, it's very, very clear, United States believed that when it uh, supported Ukraine, the rest of the world was going to fall in behind it. That has not happened, and that has caused a lot of angst and stress among people in the Biden administration. They still are not quite sure how to deal with a world in which America is not seen as being naturally uh, the force of goodness and light that everybody orients themselves around or against. That is not, that is not something that US policy policymakers are used to dealing with. And I should say, though, this builds upon what Abe said, the uh, Biden administration has been spectacularly willing, by the standard of previous administrations, to uh, look to allies and to work with allies. If you look at the way that the Russia sanctions were uh, implemented, this, and this is something we talk about briefly in the book, yeah. uh, this was done not only in consultation with Europe, but allowing Europe to take the lead on many important yeah. uh, aspects of this. And uh, that, again, is not something that is not something that is usual for a US administration. Administrations. Of course, this is not to say that the U.S. administration's uh, relationship with its allies is always um, comfortable. It's like I'm sort of sleeping in the same bed as a three-ton elephant. You know, so when the <laughs> elephant rolls over or hiccups, uh, you may find I'm sort of that you are being squashed into non-existence. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the United States, uh, the current administration has done more than uh, many previous administrations have. But the final thing I want to turn to is another thing that Anne said, which is talking about the technical nature of many of these questions. And here, you know, if, uh, I would say when the example of the space station, I haven't seen this example, but I did read there's a very interesting piece by Dan Wang, who I really recommend people who are interested in China. Uh, he is just one of the great commentators. And he has a really nice piece about semiconductors, where he argues that the problem for China is that semiconductors are not rocket science. Yeah. That in other words, rocket science is actually something that is pretty, you can do in a hierarchical from the top down kind of you do this, you do this, you do this kind of way. Semiconductors is all about building up an ecology, and that is incredibly difficult for authoritarian states to do. And so the lesson that I take from this is that I think that uh, Anne is absolutely right. There are going to be many areas in which there are going to be there's going to be pushback against the United States. And as Abe says, these dark spaces are going to expand. And uh, and, uh, but there's going to be great variation across different areas of the economy in the extent to which this happens. And in order to understand what is likely to happen in this area or in that area of the economy, we need to abandon a lot of the ideas that we have had over the last 30, 40 to 50 years, which have really been, let's forget about the detail. Let's just have some abstract models which give you a, a broad sense of what is happening, and then we can work from that. We are now back in a world where you need to have detailed technical knowledge of how the economy works in this particular sector. 
What are the particular supply chain dynamics? All of these things which we thought we could outsource to the uh, market in a kind of Hayekian miracle for decades, that does not work anymore. And one of the things that Abe and I have really tried to do with this book is we talk about how all of this stuff was thought of as being the plumbing of the global economy. Mm -hmm. It was thought about as being boring. People, uh, economists, <laughs> political scientists did not pay attention to it. And as we say, the plumbing has become political. And uh, so this means if you are uh, somebody who is studying the stuff, you have many, many opportunities to really uh, sort of uh, advance yourself at the expense of your elders by building up that detailed technical knowledge, whether you're studying, whether you're engaged in actually running on sort of things, uh, there is a huge call for detailed technical knowledge to really understand what is happening and to really get any grasp whatsoever on how this strange, bizarre world is, uh, that we are in is going to, uh, uh, how it is going to evolve, and whether it is going to evolve in the more hopeful directions or the less hopeful directions, you need detailed understanding uh, in a way that we thought that you didn't in order to figure this stuff out. Yeah. Thanks, Henry. Before we get to Q&A, um, oh, we can copy. <laughs> um, I also wanted to give Leslie and Anna a chance to respond briefly if they wanted to. I just have one, one thing I wanted to say, which is um, the, the other thing that I, you know, that we hear, and I'm sure you do a lot because you're, you're European and in Europe, um, one of you is European, um, is that it's one thing if you if you buy the US argument that this is about economic security, small yard, high fence, but a lot of Europeans feel that some of the instruments that are being used and being weaponized are actually about um, America ensuring its competitiveness, not about economic security. And that disconnect, so um, it, you know, to the extent that part of the game is to get Europe to come along, because it's not only the global south that might fall off, right now things have looked better, ironically, I mean, not ironically, tragically, because of Russia and Ukraine. Um, but if you have somebody like Trump or Trump in power and you don't have that security threat pulling the US and Europe together, those concerns on the part of many in Europe that these decisions are being taken because America wants to be rich, not because it wants to be secure, make the whole, the whole um, interaction much more complex, I think. Just a comment. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and now I feel obligated, and I've been waiting very patiently, but given the theme, I'm going to do one more LSE sales pitch very briefly. Um, <laughs> the first couple of chapters of the book reference Eric Kleiner quite a lot, who wrote one of the most important books on the diminishment of capital controls over time. Uh, and Abe and Henry credit him for kind of seeing a lot of the pitfalls of this dollar system coming about. And it's not surprising that Eric got his PhD here uh, and under student strange. Unsurprisingly, again, oh, yeah. um, at least I believe it was under certain stretch. Uh, but right. for now, I'm going to move to Q and A. If any of you have questions, please raise your hand. Um, please, oh, let's go. Uh, when the mics move around, please um, state your name and affiliation. I'm going to start with uh, that person in the corner over there. Hi there. Uh, my name is Aiden. I'm an MSc student with the International Political Economy Program. Um, you know, really excited to read the book, and I really like the metaphor that you were using around um, weaponized interdependence and kind of nuclear weapons. Or Can't hear. But, oh. Speak up. Is this on? Yeah. Okay, yeah. there we go. Um, appreciate the metaphor you were using around weaponized interdependence right now and kind of the, uh, you know, the moment where nuclear weapons came on the stage right at the beginning of the Cold War. Um, and kind of the ideas that were going around uh, with mutually assured destruction or um, the guardrails that were put afterwards to kind of regulate this new form of warfare. Um, but arguably, you know, the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons wouldn't have happened without the proliferation of them. And so in this kind of new moment that we're in right now, where we're really kind of seeing and, and building a new understanding for America's use of weaponized interdependence, you know, to the point on guardrails or regulating this, um, is that possible um, without the proliferation of this to other countries? Um, and is that proliferation even possible if um, this is a very networked thing and networks take time to develop and to really uh, harden? Do you want to respond now? Or do you want to get I, a couple of so questions? Many yeah, let's get a couple more in. Um, let's go back there in the corner. Hi, I'm Serena. I'm a third year um, BSc student. And my question is, um, what do you think the role of the Global South plays in all of this? Are they used as proxies for network expansion, or are they like 
um, that works in authoritative um, points themselves? And what do you see the trajectory of their um, role in the future? Thank you so much. Okay, and one more from Katie in the back, and then we can maybe move into response. I have a question from our online audience. Um, this is from Anne Lee Summers, who's an independent scholar at the NCIS. And she asks, how does your work include the state-related criminal activities of informal economies? like examining the financial geography of dark web informal economies like criminal transactions, money laundering and tax evasion, or for example, US sanction regimes on oligarchs during the Ukraine war. Anyone from the panel wanna get going? Start with three then. Okay, very quickly, uh, it uh, did not examine informal economies or uh, oligarchs during uh, the uh, recent war. Uh, I would turn over to uh, the expert uh, up here, Nick Kalyampur, for any uh, for for any specifics on that. He knows far more about this than uh, we do. Uh, uh, I did, as Nick mentioned, write a piece years ago for Aon, which was a fun piece, I think, more or less on the uh, economics of Silk Road, uh, this uh, dark web forum for drugs, and how it is that you try to establish security in a world where uh, you're also trying to establish anonymity, and how liberty libertarian dreams of doing that well uh, don't work out particularly well. Uh, <laughs> networks, I don't have much uh, that I can really say about. Uh, Non-proliferation, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's a, or rather, I have too much stuff to say. It's an incredibly complex and detailed topic. I would love, uh, maybe we could have a, uh, you know, email me and I, uh, we, we, we can talk afterwards. Non-proliferation, uh, there's a really, really difficult set of questions. And one of the interesting things about the European uh, security, uh, economic security strategy uh, is that von der Leyen says, and it more or less says in the strategy as well, they hope that the tools that they are developing will never have to be used. So they are developing tools purely for deterrent effect. I don't think that's going to work. I think that uh, it is probably not credible to say we have these tools, but we are never going to use them. I think that there is probably going to be a lot of messiness first, but you could see a world in which something which was like a very, very crude version of uh, understanding of uh, mutually assured destruction of uh, things that people care about in the global economy could lead to some degree of uh, unwillingness to launch upon certain things in much the same way as we've seen uh, with regard to cybersecurity. There's been far less activity uh, of a warlike nature in cybersecurity than many people expected. And that is, I think, because people realize that if you really go after our power plants in great, uh, in great sort of depths, we are going to exploit your vulnerabilities and everybody is going to end up in a bad place. But actually getting to a place where this creates real long-term uh, real long-term uh, stable expectations is going to be very, very, very difficult to do. I just in the first question about um, the you know will we only have stability when other countries have competing nodes and that's how I take that question of you know competing networks and one of the things that we try to to say in the book is that th there is a historical contingency about the U.S.'s ability to use this power, which was these private companies built these networks when people thought or you weren't thinking about US power or thought it was benign. And so now that we see that these networks can be used for these purposes, it's much more difficult for a country like China to say, hey, let's build some networks. Oh, they're fine. They're so nice. Just, just, just use them, no problem. You know, and that's where you see the whole conversation about the Belt and Road. And you know, it's like these efforts to build Chinese versions of these networks face so many more political questions. And so I think you're gonna see a very different uh, kind of a rolling out of that kind of w whether the other countries could build these networks in opposition. At the same time, I do think that the United States is has to move first in building these guardrails. And I would just say, like one example is is thinking about who the target is. You know, so going after another great power with these tools, it's very provocative. And and also that the end of it is to um, to deteriorate 
that company's capabilities is also quite provocative. And so, you know, just imagine a Chinese government initiative to degrade the New York Stock Exchange. Like if that was happen, that would I think the United States would react in a very so. I think there's some simple guardrails that we could put up, you know, that would would be easy to get to. But as we said in the book, you know, a lot of times it's there's a wicked problem an agency's facing. They act without really thinking through the downstream consequences, and that there because there isn't any foresight about like what should the parameters be of how we use these, um, you can get yourself in trouble. Um, I also just wanted to you know in the dark web conversation or you know is there things that are untraceable? One of the things that we kind of return to a theme in the book is just how in these efforts that private actors make to decentralize things, there is just this competing drive to make money. And when they have that competing drive to make money, they want to be at the center of a network. And so as much as you hear about, you know, the future will be decentralized, and you know, it's like you just have to go to the crypto debate and the wallets, the infrastructure firms behind them, you know, you often then get these, these points of centralization. And I think we're seeing that play out right now as the US government shifts focus to uh, crypto systems as a sanctions target. And that's like the next wave of this. And, and so I, I'm, I, not that, that the dark web or you know, these uh, criminal um, systems don't exist, but they often exist because the politicians let them exist, because the rich people want them to exist. But if the preferences change, if there's another uh, political agenda, uh, whether it's stopping terrorism or confronting an adversary, I think that they'll find those choke points uh, to go after them. And Leslie, do you want to add to it? Great. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, we'll go for three more. Um, that man down there has been very patient. And then here, and then in the corner over there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a um, former UK law enforcement intelligence analyst who worked for the European Commission over a number of years in Ukraine, um, including with the State Security Service. They very much knew what was coming. Uh, my question is, how has the book played in a continental European audience, particularly vested interests in such like the central EU institutions? Because believe you me, they've got an awful yeah, yes, exactly. They have an awful lot of questions to answer. If you haven't read the Alex Dryden books, Red to Black series, or the book I put on the table in front of Commission staff in Kiev in 2014, which was Tom Clancy's Command Authority, I would urge you to read it. Thank you. Um, so, as the distinguished members just um, talk about how um, there's this new dynamic of, uh, of the system, do you see a role for like uh, middle powers to, um, to in, in setting the agenda and also to leverage for, uh, for like to optimizing their own interest in this, in the current like financial system? Hi, uh, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Rohan. I teach in the uh, same department as Nikhil. Um, <laughs> my question is about the impact of this, on, of empire on the metropole, on the United States, right? So there's a, the, the origin story is interesting, which is 9-11, which on the security front, you can see this sort of trend of huge centralization of power, spying on Americans, uh, even targeting American citizens abroad uh, with drones and things like that. So there's this kind of effect on American society and politics, which is very corrosive, the way empire does corrode both those who are subject to it, but also those who run it. Uh, is there a similar version of that story in the economic side where the centralization of economic power leads to a certain approach to markets and, and governance in America, which over time corrodes that which is truly American? The second order effects of this conflict with China and other things may over time make America unrecognizable to itself, just as 9-11 has done on the political side. And is that a worry for the long term?
Um, okay, so I think um, on the first point about continental uh, Europe, so I lived in Germany for the last year. Um, I was in Berlin, and one of the things that I was really just struck by over and over was the kind of the shock uh, and the, um, the, the, the there was a, just not a clear path forward. There was there's such a belief that openness would drive benefits and, and peace, um, and that that has really been shattered. And so it was a fumbling through of what was the next step. And at the same time, there is the tension that the Trump administration had used these tools against the interests of continental Europe in a way that continental Europe had no response to it. But now in the Ukraine crisis, uh, continental Europe is so dependent on these tools and the United States. And so it's both that the organizing principle of foreign economic policy, uh, the Germans have this expression, Wandel durch Handel, you know, it's like, we're gonna change the world through trade. Um, that that's just evaporated, the four freedoms of the EU, you know. Uh, and I think the struggle is, is that policymakers see the vulnerabilities that are there. Henry and I have both talked to um, commission officials over several iterations, and they're very aware of what these problems are. But at the same time, I don't know if people have followed uh, VW, BASF, uh, the, kind of the German DAX companies. They're basically saying, oh no, <laughs> we are all in on China right now. And so you know, it, it's not just about what the policymakers want. It's a conflict about what the, how that economic system created incentives and now the struggle of trying to find what's the new path forward. And so I think that's really difficult. Um, I also want to just say about the, the, um, the erosion, how, how could the centralization of economic power, how could it lead to a, you know, a transformation in the economy of the United States? And, and what I think what we're seeing, and we're not there yet, but it's, um, there's a movement in the United States to decenter power in the economic sphere. So the Biden administration came in with this kind of, uh, kind of a, a, an economic agenda for the middle class. Part of that was about using competition policy to rein in large companies. And clearly this story then helps those companies tell a different agenda to say, you can't break us up because you need us if you're gonna fight China. And so you know, there's a, a political fight happening where our story kind of layers over efforts to put in check economic centralization. Um, but I think, to be honest, uh, you know, the American oligarchs uh, have been uh, ascendant for quite some time. I don't know that they need us uh, mm -hmm. to get any further. Okay, just on the uh, question of middle powers and leverage, this is again, it's a very interesting story that we don't tell, but that I think is a very, you know, is definitely worth investigating. India here, I think, is particularly interesting. If you look at, on the one hand, India likes it some cheap Russian oil very, very much. Uh, this is, uh, you know, th this has been something that India has been quite good at getting. Equally, India uh, does not want to uh, detach itself too far from the United States uh, because uh, it perceives that uh, China as being not only a potentially hostile power, but of course a hostile power that it has somewhat contested borders with. And so uh, you see uh, India, I think, being quite astute in using its uh, partly detached but not fully detached uh, position as a means to sort of extract leverage, extract concessions, and uh, you know, sort of effectively push the United States uh, to do things in ways that favor its interests to a greater extent than would otherwise be the case. Uh, with respect to the question of whether or not this um, sort of has corrosive or corrupting effects for the United States, I think one of the things that really every time I talk to a US official about this, I try to hammer home the importance and the crucial value to the United States in strategic terms of the rule of law, of the fact that United States authorities are constrained, at least to some degree, by uh, the fact that there are laws, it is a country of lawyers, for better or for worse, and this <laughs> is an incredible pain for uh, policy makers in the short term, because they find themselves constrained from doing things that they believe are urgently needed, uh, right now, right now, right now, because the law tells them that they can't do it. Uh, uh, they sometimes, of course, find clever ways to work around it, and so on, and so on, and so on, but over the longer term, 
firm, having that is an incredibly valuable asset because it means, as uh, Abe was saying, China doesn't have that. Uh, if you uh, entrust your assets to uh, the uh, systems which are controlled by the Chinese government, you have no guarantee that the Chinese government isn't going to decide tomorrow that it, it, it likes the look of those assets and it wants to take them for itself. Whereas the United States is at least to some extent constrained. But increasingly, I think the worry is, as the US looks to compete with China, if it begins to abandon some of those constraints in a pursuit of uh, competition with this, other, uh, uh, with this other actor, which it perceives as being uh, able to do stuff that it can't because uh, China is not constrained in these ways, it may lose this long-term advantage in pursuit of short-term objectives. And that would be a very bad thing. Great, so let's go back to Q&A, please. Um, we're going to do one question down there, uh, one more from the online, please, and the person in the back with the glasses as well. Jamie Knight, member of the public. I just wondered, um, globalized, globalization was uh, something that the economic elite, I would think, tried to promote to, for their benefit of the profits of big companies, but they haven't taken into account how far nationalism is. We were taught, you were taught all about countries just now, and nationalism seems to be the biggest um, problem we have to try and solve. If it's not political solvable, I just wonder what your thoughts were on it, please. I have a um, question from Bo Shi Wu, who works at Google, and he asks, does weaponized interdependence also apply to corporations, and to what extent do they pursue an autonomous geopolitical agenda, which Strange alluded to? If this is the case, what can states do about it? Does that person really work at Google? <laughs> <laughs> it can be anyone they on used the internet. to be at the LSE. Hi, I'm a master's of science student in the social anthropology department. So I'm just kind of curious, namely about the relationship that China has, particularly for the ongoing future. So just this year alone, the um, internationalization of the Chinese UN has increased since January. It's the, it does seem like, you know, it's still negligible to the US dollar, but it is rising, especially with Belt and Road Initiative and the increased investment in Africa it does seem like the playing field is leveling out. At least it, it, it's, you know, predicate something for the future. So I'm just curious what the what you would anticipate the landscape is going to look like moving forward. Okay, um, so <laughs> <laughs> nationalism, it's a huge question that we don't, as you say, uh, talk about in the book. Uh, I think that uh, it probably, uh, you know, so if, if we're thinking about the world, we think about the world in terms of these economic relations between countries and the extent to which uh, increased nationalism leads perhaps to uh, countries uh, stepping <coughs> out of the game, as for example with the United Kingdom deciding to uh, leave the European Union. Uh, this is something which uh, doesn't, we can't explain but which certainly has consequences for the stuff that we are talking about. Uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom in our world, in terms of the things that we look at, would be in a far, far stronger position if they were working together. That is, if there was a, uh, a connection between the uh, city of London and the powers that are associated with it, and the uh, regulatory power of the European Union, uh, both the EU and the United Kingdom would be substantially better off. Uh, of course, I'm sort of, uh, the uh, likelihood of that of sort of happening in the, uh, medium, in the short to medium term uh, is extremely low thanks to the uh, forces of nationalism that you identify. Uh, do corporations pursue a unconstrained agenda? Uh, sometimes. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, and we, in our original academic work, we look at the conditions under which uh, under which state governments are capable of cons controlling corporations. And I think you know, if governments have regulatory power, they are actually by and large able to make uh, corporations uh, do, you know, so corporations do not have the, uh, do not have the uh, battalions themselves, 
But uh, of course, corporations are extremely good at figuring out ways to bring politicians on side, as Abe said, with respect to uh, Germany. And I think one other example which uh, we talked about briefly in the uh, briefly in the talk is uh, Elon, Elon Musk and Starlink. So this is something which is a quite incredible situation where the U.S. government literally you have uh, senior Defense Department officials uh, paying court to Elon Musk in order to uh, you know, in order to placate him and in order to get him to uh, bring these systems on board. I think that if the United States was not as politically split as it is, if and if Elon Musk did not obviously have potential supporters on the Republican side of the aisle, it would be far, far more difficult for Musk to pursue the kind of independent agenda that he has. So one of the lessons I think that you get from that is when you have uh, societies where politicians are deeply divided and when there are many veto points, it's going to be far harder to constrain uh, corporations from doing the things that they want to do. And uh, with regard to uh, you know, the yuan is increasing in size, you can also say that of the uh, Chinese alternative to SWIFT. They are still pretty small. So I think that this is still at the level where clearly there's going to be more stuff that is happening in spaces that are outside the direct uh, visible uh, control of the United States, more things happening outside of the dollar clearing system. But uh, we are. this is still at the level of uh, dark spaces expanding rather than any plausible competitor to the dollar emerging any time in the uh, near to immediate future, I think is what Abe and I would say. Equally, there are some very important uh, economists, people like Barry Eichengreen, uh, who disagreed with us uh, on this in a piece with, in Foreign Affairs last year, who have, uh, you know, they have their own arguments, and, uh, you, and, and uh, Eichengreen is a very, very intelligent person, so uh, I, would, uh, you know, I would read uh, what he has to say and what other people have to say, as well as us to get a complete picture of the debate. And, and I would just say, I think the mistake people make is that when they hear our story, and they say, well, why wouldn't every, anybody just want to protect themselves from that? Why wouldn't they want to create their own thing? They were like, how, you know, everybody's just going to make their own networks. But if you look at the domestic politics that happen in political economies around companies, they're very complicated. And a lot of times the government does not run in concert with what those private actors are doing. And so Henry made the, gave the example of Brexit. You know, the EU and the UK would have loved to have their own hub to stand up against the United States and say, we have this alternative. But it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, you know, because of domestic political constraints. And if you take China, you know, there's been a series of domestic political actions that have undermined China's capability to really have an alternative to the dollar or to play a role in these financial plumbings. So I'll just give quickly, um, there was this company called Ant Financial. And it was really ready to be a competitor to Visa, PayPal, a global payment system. It was beyond just China's borders, and it was going to have many of the, of the characteristics um, that we, we were talking about. Um, but that the owner of that company, Jack Ma, he started to uh, accumulate power, you know, money, influence, and the government said, you know, that's a threat to us. This is an oligarch in the making, and what oligarchs want, not just money, they want power. And so the government, you know, he was disappeared at some point, you know, and then he reappears. The company was basically, you know, sliced up um, and demobilized. That wasn't because of our story. You know, like, our story is just another layer, but really what governments care about is domestic politics. That's what they're focused on. And you could just play the same story with um, COVID zero, the reaction to the Hong Kong uh, democracy protests. You know, China has in many ways shot itself in the foot in these actions when it comes to standing up an alternative a financial plumbing. That has nothing to do with us. That has to do with they're facing real challenges and those actions go against uh, this response. And so I think we should always be um, just modest in our, like, uh, there's a set of political scientists who are like, well, the, the rational response would be to create your own thing. It's like, life is very complicated and it's often driven by other incentives than, than this stuff. Uh, on that wonderfully optimistic note. Uh, I was hoping to exercise my power as chair. I was really enjoying it, but we are actually at time now. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you again to Leslie, to Anne, to Abe, and to Henry, to the staff for putting this, this talk together, and to all of you for coming. Again, we've joked about it. It really is a really ugly day out, and all of you have been so engaged throughout, so I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you.